And what we're going to talk about today is one of my passionate topics, and that's actually branding. So we're going to talk about how branding has changed. I love this slide because it has a couple dinosaurs on it. I love dinosaurs. And it's really the idea that social media is going away. So all of this fun stuff we're doing, and when I say going away, just the term of it is pretty tired. Are you guys as sick of hearing it as I am? Let's hear a woo for being sick of hearing that term. Woo! All right. We're done. Social media is dead. But it will be something that you still do at public relations professionals, marketing, the actual people in your organization are going to be doing this on a daily basis. But what we're going to talk about today, there we go, is your brand is out of control. So um, we're going to talk about three topics. This clicker is not working. One is transparency. And then the next is customer relations. And then we're going to talk about a fun one at the end, and that's anger management. So we're not at all really talking about social media. We're talking about real activities that happen online that are related to branding. And the first one is going to be transparency. This right here is a screenshot. And I put links on all my screenshots so you guys can check it out too. This is a screenshot of me searching for how much does Radian 6 cost? Radian 6 is a social monitoring tool that you can actually buy as a service and you can install it and kind of keep track of all of your different profiles and this kind of thing. On their website, they will not tell me how much it costs. So what did I do? I went to Google and I said, how much does Radian 6 cost? And there were posts, of course, that listed like you can actually see in the description text of the post without actually leaving Google that somebody has up there saying that it costs $500 a month to use. So all I had to do was type in Google how much does Radian 6 cost and individual people told me. So Radian 6 won't, but people will. This is a little bit scary because have you done it to your own products and services? Have you gone to Google and typed in your name, ask how much it costs, or related to your services, how much should a service cost, or these kind of things, and seeing what the public tells you it should. This is actually a little bit of a scary thing in that you can no longer keep secrets from the public because the public is going to tell about it. Here's another fun example. Um, I went to Disney World recently. I love Disney World. I have three daughters. They love Disney World. Um, I've been a whole lot of times. They have this great dining program kind of thing. We got to go and it was, it was fun. We signed up for that. And it's part of this extra marketing push that they do. They send you these different programs that they have. And they have this rewards, Disney Magic Rewards program. And it sounds cool. Like the, you can spend $600 and you get an extra $300 worth of cash to spend if, on like a credit card that they have. And you're like, wow, an extra 300 bucks for nothing? I was going to spend that money anyways. I'd like to find out a little more. And I was digging online, and I was having a hard time finding it on the Disney website. I could not find the information about the Magic Rewards. But Google, once again, gave me the answer. Somebody that signed up for the program actually scanned in a PDF of the uh, rules and regulations for using that. So they got the card, and then they did a little PDF. They scanned it posted up the details online, and what you find out quite quickly is the money has so many limitations. You can't use it for food, you can only use it in certain locations, and all this kind of thing. And so after you read the regulations, you're like, oh, I'm not quite sure that I want to do that, and so we didn't, even though it was free money on the site. My point is that you can't really keep secrets from people anymore. People are out there talking about your products and services. They're doing great things like scanning in PDFs of your documents and posting them online in forums. This was actually like some Disney forum here. That um, people talk about you on a regular basis. How many of you guys have put your name in social mention? Anybody? Anybody go to social? If you're at a computer, go to socialmention.com and put your name in and try a little bit of experiment. It'll show you how many people are talking about you. It'll show you the strength of people talking about you. This is actually a social mention search for Beau Rivage Casino. So um, th it's talking about poker and people staying there. The top, it'll give you the top keywords for people's posts related to the name of your company. So the point is there are an awful lot of people out there 
talking about you. And that means that the giant lives. That if we were to compare, and you guys have been in, I think I'm the, am I the last speaker that you guys get to hear? Yeah, okay. H have you all heard a little bit of search engine marketing stuff, right? We've heard about that. You've heard people say you got to develop a lot of content. What I want to tell you guys is you as a company cannot develop as much content as the giant that lives can. The people that talk about you develop more content than you do. So they're out there talking about the different product services, your food, your spice. Those guys are passionate about you guys, right? If you've got a great brand, they're going to promote your brand. If you do something wrong, they're going to talk about that too. But you cannot control this giant. It's out there talking about the things that you do. Facebook, and this is actually an older slide, but it's growing at 600,000 people a day. In the community of Houston, about a month ago I checked, there were 1,250,000 people on Facebook. As a population, that's about a quarter of Houston's population. If we were to look at broadband users, that's something like 60% of broadband users in Houston are on Facebook. And that is an over the age of 18 statistic, by the way. So it's adults on Facebook that I'm talking about. It's an enormous amount of people. So how big is that? Well, this little slide right here, it's kind of hard to read, but the number of households that watched MASH final episode was 50 million households. So MASH the final episode is one of the famous episodes of all time for having a huge viewership that actually watched it. Advertisers paid tons of money, so it was worth a big deal. How big is that in comparison to something like 125 million people that saw the evolution of dance? It's on 125 million people views is an awful lot of views for a piece of content. So we're comparing that to 50 million households of MASH. There's, there's some interesting things that you have to look at. Well, how much advertising revenue did the guys that put up Evolution of Dance get out of this whole thing? Or how much revenue do people, how much revenue was spent advertising for the final episode of MASH? And, and how big is this? Is the internet an underrated media of marketing right now? Is it kind of laggard and people actually paying money for it? Are we going to pay money to advertise on YouTube as a group? I mean, is your company ready to do that? It's a lot of people. Let's look at Facebook. There are a billion photos uploaded to Facebook each month. There are more than 10 million videos uploaded, a billion pieces of content, um, more than two and a half million events created each month, more than 45 million active user groups. That's a lot of content developed by the giant every month just in Facebook. Facebook is also, um, it, it, it's not totally consistent, but the last time I checked, it hit wise the second most popular website in the world right behind Google. It has been third underneath the Yahoo property sites but Facebook is the second most trafficked website in the world. It's got an awful lot of people developing content on there. And what does that mean to us? That means that the cops are here, that you are policed by what you say and what you do in this community. Uh, Courtney Pemberton, how many friends on Facebook do you have? Yeah, so Courtney Pemberton has 1,100 friends on Facebook. If Courtney Pemberton says that her boss Aaron sucks, then 1,100 people get to see that in their stream. If 10%, 100 of those comment on Aaron sucks, then the average number of friends that those people have is 120. It's 100 times 120. That's an awful lot of people that get to see Aaron sucks. So Courtney's my cop. She polices me to make sure that I'm always growing her, always giving her fantastic content. She's making sure that I'm actually the person that I, I'm supposed to be to her, her boss that teaches and coaches and do, does these things. So if you're a company and you're talking about what you provide as a service or offering, the cops are out there talking about you and they're going to tell whether or not you do a good job. So you have to really think, what is your value? I put up a um, screenshot of, this is the picture from Dr. Sketchy's Anti-Art School, the website for the Houston Sketchy Group. 
And I like this because one of the funny things about the value of Dr. Sketchy for me is there are lots of arts organizations out there, but this is one of the few organizations that is an arts organization that actually reaches me. I consider myself an artist. I have a fine art degree from Texas Tech University. I've drawn on Space Jam, Quest for Camelot, Prince of Egypt, Disney Actor, video games. I do all kinds of fun art stuff, but for, as a general rule, a lot of the art organizations miss me as a target. And Sketchy is a free group of people that have coordinated together to create this movement of artists having fun and drinking beer and drawing naked people. And I wanted to be a part of it. So it actually reaches me. So when you're looking at a branding perspective, do you, what is your audience? What's your value to them? And if you decide what your value is, one of the fun things about the Tony Sachs guys that are here is I think the largest amount of comments that I've seen on your Facebook is what do you put Tony Sashery's on, right? And then one of the funny statements that I get when I go to meet them in their office is the first thing that someone does when they meet you is what? They all go back to the they, and, and they tell you what they put it on, right? They always tell you what they put it on. I, I mentioned that I work with Tony Sashery's to a few of my friends. There's a guy named Charles that I, that's from Louisiana, and he starts immediately telling me the things he puts Tony Sashery's on. So from an audience and branding perspective, when they mention the name, the first thing that comes in as a related statement is, what do I put Tony Sashery's on? And people are passionate about that, so that you had 250 comments on that isn't a surprise, is it? Let's see if we can change it. Uh, 111 comments, and I'm actually afraid to read them. I don't know what they were. <laughs> the, this next part is, okay, so we're getting the idea that the brand is no longer in your control. The people in the world create more content than you guys do, so you are what they say you are. You're whatever value they give you. If you're Tony Sacheries, it's easy to be a spice, and people love to engage with that brand. If you're Schiphol, it's a little bit of a, a weird brand. What do we do, Ed? I, don't, I mean, we make websites, we talk educational stuff, but it's a little bit more difficult. So what are we in the community? We are what they say we are. Um, when we look at customer relations, and we're talking about specifically social sites, why do they go there? This is a statistic that shows that of adults and teens, there's a 90% rule. People go to social networking sites to keep up with existing friends. That's what they do. I mean, you know, like flirting's way down here at 20% and 17% for teens. So, you know, when I mention it to people that aren't on Facebook, they're like, well, that's a dating site. I don't want to go there. I'm married and all this kind of stuff. It's not for flirting. It's for keeping up with existing friends. My mom's on it, these kind of things. So if we look at how that applies as a customer relations standpoint, this is a good example of how it works. This guy right here is Oren Parker. Does anybody know Oren? You may follow him on Twitter. You guys know Oren because you're from Louisiana. Oren's from Lake Charles. Um, I met him when I was in Lake Charles, and turns out Oren likes comic books. He likes art. So a lot of the same sort of, he likes advertising. If you're to look at, um, if you're to look at my RSS feed aggregator, it's full of comic books, art, advertising. So Oren and I have similar interests. So we like each other, right? Oren lives in Lake Charles. If it wasn't for Twitter and Facebook, I would not be friends with Oren Parker. Because what it does is it helps facilitate this friendship relationship. So when we're looking at keeping up with existing friends, these tools are amazing at allowing us to have this connection. This clicker is horrible. <clears throat> this is a touch graph, and when you're looking at that one step away, it's showing a touch graph of my friends. And uh, if I make a comment on somebody, if Maggie makes a comment on my blog, then you'll actually see this is Maggie up here. Her friends that are not connected to me get to see this. So this is the one step away thing. And then we're going to talk about that 253 comments that you guys have. And what I want to tell people is this is about what the Facebook math of that looks like. If you got 253 comments, oh man, the fonts. Oh, 253 comments. <laughs> eh, 
All right. Well, the 253 comments ended in 5,060 um, people seeing the comment. And the way that I figure that is they have 253 people that commented. Each one of those has 120 friends on average, and that's a statistic given by Facebook. We already know that Courtney has 1,100, right? So she's way, way above average when it comes to that. So that figure ends up being plus 30,000, right? But not 30,000 people didn't see it. That's not going to be a true statement. However, half of the people, so if you divided by the number of people that go to Facebook every day, half of the people have the potential to see it. And then if you look at that half and you say maybe a third of the half that went did, then you actually end up with a figure of 5,060 people. The exposure ratio of that one sentence was 5,060 people. That's a lot for something that took a couple seconds to write, right? It's a huge outreach tool when you start getting down to the actual Facebook mathematics that are in there. If you get 100 comments, then that's 1,000 people right there that have seen it come through their stream. And this isn't fanciful math either. We're actually dividing it by a third of the people. And some of the exposure is going to depend how many friends you have. Like Courtney probably misses more than I do because you have so many friends in your stream. So there will be a different ratio for different people, but it's something that you need to be aware of. So we're going to get back to why people do it, and now we're going to talk about how the customer relations part of this works. First, you have to think about people. They're cats, not dogs. So people are finicky. They do what they want whenever they want to do it. They're not like dogs. You can't ring a bell and get them to do any kind of activity that you want. So they're like, I want to do this. I don't want to do this. And if we look at how this works on Facebook, I talk about the Facebook four. There are four things that work with your friends. There's four things that work as a company. The first is status updates. Whenever they're talking and you make a comment about something you're doing or you comment about something else someone does, that fits into the 90% rule of what you would do with a friend. So it works as a company. It works as a friend. If you upload photos of things that you've done, like Sokol Volleyball Camp actually has photos listed up here, and you comment on photos of things you've done and, photo, and then comment on the photos of the things people have done, like the guy that has the tattoo the Tony Sashers, it's a great play to comment, get them in your stream. Then it's something you would do with your friends. It's something that works as a company. You would share links and video. So one of the tools that you use within these social networks is sharing links of information to videos. It's something you would do as a friend. It's something that you can do as a company and be successful. And then organizing events. And probably the one negative part I have about Facebook is I get too many events. I don't actually attend any of them. So I have an enormously full event stream and I kind of ignore the majority of it. But it is something that you would do with friends is organize events and you can do it as a company too. Everything outside of that, as far as a company goes, pretty much falls into a gray zone. When I mean gray zone, if you're looking at branding, you can do Facebook advertising, but it's analogous to a billboard. People are not going to Facebook to buy my services. They're going there to keep up with existing friends. If they see an ad for Shipple Conference, we run ads for Shipple Conference, then it's more like a billboard that they're passing on the street than it is an actual, um, I'm going to click it and go to the ShippleCon and immediately give my registration. So if, if you're looking at ways to be successful on Facebook, the way for a company to be successful and do customer relations, it, even outside of Facebook, is it, the, what you do is you actually have to relate to people as friends. And you look at the global community, one of the fun things that's happened is in the old days, people used to know the guys that worked in their grocery store and the butchers and things like that, you know, way back. And then we had huge companies take over and it became Walmart and Target. And Walmart and Target had this huge blanket of you didn't know the people very well. Or you didn't have a way to talk and say anything about the way that they do. Now the people are the giant and the companies are smaller the people can say whatever they want about the companies and it's more like living in a small town again. You actually relate to people on an individual level. So it doesn't matter that you make a comment about one person in Facebook or it doesn't matter that that isn't an advertisement on television that's a commercial. Your outreach to people can be as many as 5,000 people with one statement. 
So it's important to relate that to customer relations. Y'all all have your username? The, f the Facebook username thing, I put this in here in case somebody doesn't. If you, if you don't have your username, your facebook.com slash username, and you try to grab it, by now it's too late. So it, it, it really is, you won't be able to get it. But um, Facebook username, this gets into personal branding. One of the things that you want to do is actually have your company name. So Kalachi Factory or Don Nilsson, you want to go in and establish that with profiles. This last thing that we're going to talk about is anger management. Anger management is um, it's something that is heavily related to your success online. How do you deal with people that are negative online? And I've got a few stories for you. This first one is the St. Louis Cardinals. One, um, this is a Twitter page for the St. Louis Cardinals, or at least seems that way. If you actually read the description up at the top, it says that this is a Twitter page of fans of St. Louis Cardinals and not officially St. Louis Cardinals. They had several thousand followers, and pretty much St. Louis Cardinals was late to the game in trying to organize Twitter group. And so the fans have grown thousands of people, and they did not. And then the fans did something that I call stupid. They, um, they sign up for an automatic responder on Twitter so that if you say the name St. Louis Cardinals, the Twitter name, it will retweet it. So you can say they suck and it'll retweet it. Now they're not the only ones. I actually heard the Astros had one for a while. But this, this violates the 90% rule. You would not do this with your friends so it's not going to work on the internet at all. And what happened, and it even gets worse, because if you look on TweetDeck, without the description from Twitter, you can't tell the difference between that logo of St. Louis Cardinals, the unofficial St. Louis Cardinals, and St. Louis Cardinals official logo. So from a branding perspective, that is St. Louis Cardinals, right? And they retweeted it. And every time somebody said something, their automatic tool retweets it. And it keeps showing up in the stream over and over and over again as I signed up for an automatic tool. St. Louis Cardinals has more problems than that because they had people on Twitter representing the dead, uh, but representing Tony LaRusso talking about dead pitchers. And they sued the person on Twitter that was, they sued Twitter for it. And in this case, I think they're right. I think if you're going to represent a celebrity and now they're actually trying to validate if you're a celebrity or not, if you're actually saying that you are somebody else, there's legal ramifications for it. But in the earlier example of the fans doing something stupid like signing up for an autoresponder, you, you can't sue them. You can't sue your fans for doing something that dumb. It would look bad, right? It would end up on the news as St. Louis Cardinals sues their fans. So what do you end up doing? How do you manage this? And it gets weirder because if you look at advertising, it's um, how long the, if we start looking at the rise of social media, MySpace 2006, Facebook 2007, and Twitter 2008, like you watch the charts on Google, you go back to web content before that and, and search that it's just now getting to a point where advertising they had a branding conference, and for the first time this last year, 2009, they said image and awareness are decreasing in web traffic and customer focus are increasing. So at their conference, for the first time, they actually say something about the internet. And it's, it's a little late in the game to figure that out. Clay Shirky says, the loss of control that you feel is already in the past. And I love this picture. I think it's exciting, don't you? So I'll actually repeat that. The loss of control that you feel is already in the past. It's in the hands of people. And so how do you relate to people online? This is actually kind of a pretty brave one because we're a Shipple group, and this is actually talking about a failure that we had. Now this is a, a North Florida PRSA group. Anybody here from North Florida PRSA? No. They took a YouTube video of someone having problems editing and sending an email newsletter out with our software. They posted it online, and the title was Epic Fell, Tendency Epic Fell, and then they tweeted it, and our guys caught it in the stream as soon as it came through. So the first thing that happens is they announced it, they tweeted it out. How do you handle this? Because they had, what happened is they were trying to edit a newsletter. It took them four hours. They got frustrated. 
And so they sent that complaint out to everybody that they knew in that community. The first thing that you have to do as a human being is say you're sorry. So I think you'll see right down here, this says, hi, I'm Katie. Is Katie in there? Yeah. This says, hi, I'm Katie. We're sorry that you had trouble. Please contact us. We sent them individual emails, and then we also did this, which is send out a Twitter of them saying that they had problems with our software. What's really funny is we have a lot more followers than they do, so the temptation was, and even the temptation internally was to not publicize it in our own stream, but then that would be wrong. We wanted to say we're sorry publicly, even though we have more people following us than they do. And we didn't do any kind of weird business denial of this fact. And when you get under the hood, some of the things where they had really, really ugly code in their newsletter, and they're, they're not HTML editors, they kept publishing that code over and over again, and it got very difficult to edit. So it needed to be cleaned up. They were having a really hard time. So there's a temptation to just say, okay, you've only got 100 followers, we'll not say anything. But you have to say you're sorry. And that's probably the important takeaway is that customer relations has now become a human level. And if you do something wrong, you say you're sorry. So we said we're sorry. And then you take it one step further, and that is you have to change yourself. And so we did an event on the calendar for our newsletter training. We have probably three training events a week for the things that we do. So we had an event on the calendar scheduled for newsletter training. We posted a blog post here, and actually the blog post says a new editor is coming for the newsletter. And what we did is we put a link under our newsletter tool that went to the beta test of another editor that we're working on. We told those guys about it and sent it out in a notice to our clients that if you're having trouble with the current editor that's on the newsletter page, click this link and try a different one. So we actually wrote different software. We had training for our clients. We said we were sorry and published it out to our Twitter stream. We said we're sorry and left a comment on the YouTube video. So if you're looking at anger management, we admitted our fault and then we publicized it and we're trying to be as transparent as possible because if you watch the earlier slides, there's no such thing as a secret anymore. The people are going to talk to talk about it. You can search. So, did you do your own YouTube video on it? No, we just left a comment on theirs. But the training is on Vimeo. Yeah, and the training is on Vimeo. So it's it's true. The training classes were a webinar, a original webinar that we recorded and also reposted on the internet. Another anger management issue I'd like to talk about is you do have people that are out there to get you. Did anybody read this Houston Press article about the zoo? the intent of the article is just completely negative. So they took and posted their favorite items, that they, the favorite moments of the zoo, and the favorite moments were when some guy was on acid and he climbed into one of the cages and was yelling and said that he was teaching his kids a lesson. I swear they're really, really horrible stories. And, they, and they're showing them and they posted it on Houston Press. Well. In this case, like going in and feeding this guy who just has negative response probably isn't going to get you anywhere. So what the zoo did was they posted pages on their own site and sent messaging out saying what we want you to do is tell us your favorite moments. And then their page had tons and tons of community comments. I didn't get to see Paula Berg speak yesterday because I was in another room doing things. But um, one of the things that I can imagine that she talked about was their audience defends their brand. If it, I remember going back and looking at the skirt incident, they didn't have to leave many comments on the blog at all because people were saying, I defend you Southwest Airlines. This is a very similar statement that the people that love the zoo are defending the zoo. So what is important is setting up those relationships to begin with, having an audience of 25,000 people that are willing to passionately defend your brand, having them all connected, and then giving them a place where they can respond. So part of this anger management is ignore the trolls, but let your people defend for you. You can't do that overnight. Like Ed said, you cannot establish a blog in response to an emergency crisis. You must have this network established in advance. 
So one of the things that's important is to make sure you have your network established. And then the last one, when we're talking about anger management, this one isn't so mad, but I want to show you what happens and how to deal with a group of people when something unexpected happens. I did a search for Houston Zoo in Twitter, and in the group pages that are listed, you'll see this bring the penguins to the Houston Zoo group showing. And the reason I like to say that, it's not necessarily angry, and it's not necessarily negative, but it's not positive either. It's a bunch of people that want them to bring penguins to the zoo, but I don't think that you can ignore them. They're a bunch of high school kids, and they have several different fans kind of following this group, and they've actually had some discussion threads and things like that. They love penguins. I mean, that, uh, they're kind of cute animals. They don't fly, which is sad, but um, <laughs> they, they fly underwater. That's not flying, Dan. So they, they wanted them to bring them. So how do you deal with this? The reason that you have to deal with it as web content and a link into the zoo, this shows on the same front page search as the actual zoo group does, right? So let's talk about branding. These kids show up every time the zoo did. That's pretty powerful, right? So we want people that see this group to get to the zoo. If you're the zoo, what do you do? Engage them. Engage them. Their names are right here as, as officers on the side of the page with links to their profiles. How easy would it be to have three kids out to the zoo and give them a backstage tour, right? And then what will they do? They'll talk about it, spread it. So you guys kind of get the idea. They may be high school kids, and, but they do show on the front page of Facebook search for the same result as the Houston Zoo. So you can't ignore them. You have to engage them. The cost of engaging them is what? Just a little bit of time to hang out with, right? Just a little bit of time, maybe even making comments on this page is all you have to do. Go ahead, Jason. And they're also future patrons yeah. of the zoo as adults, and they're going to bring their kids, and so you're just setting up. Right. They have some kind of passion, right? They have some kind of passion for animals. I'm sure if they love penguins, they'll probably like other animals as well. So why not get them to be part of the people that promote the zoo, right? And the cost is just a little bit of time and reaching out, and their names are public on the page. First name, last name, link to their profile. So that kind of rounds us out on the whole branding thing. The first thing you have to take away is it's totally transparent that the world out there is talking about you, talking about your brand, talking about your service. You cannot keep secrets from them because they're releasing it. So Radian 6 may not want me to know the price because it might shy people away without a salesperson engaging them or that kind of thing. They don't have a choice. It's already posted online. So transparency is the first thing. When it comes to client relations, I just want to show you the power of that connected group of people. And we kind of know the social media, but I love Facebook math, and that is the number of people you can reach with a small number of comments. It's worth your time. And the last thing is, Anger management, probably the hardest thing to do with anger management is actually to change yourself. And in the case that we did it, I know from internal that making those posts wasn't an easy thing to do. There were conversations in the background. And when it came back to it, and I think Dan even had, you know, had a relationship in that, said, well, you tell people to do it, right? That's pretty much what it was. We're like, okay, we've got to do what we say we're going to do. And so we posted publicly and dealt with that anger. And... That's the story of branding. What, what can I click?